Number 1. But despite huge police hunts, multiple arrests and a court case, no trace of her has been found. One freezing day in December 1991, 18-year-old Nicola Payne set off to walk the short distance from her boyfriend's house to her family home in the Potter's Green area of Coventry. Filled with excitement about her first Christmas as a mother to seven-month-old Owen, she waved goodbye to her partner Jason Cook and left. Nicola never made it home. It's almost certain she was abducted, killed and her body dumped in a lake or canal near to where she went missing. Three decades later, she is presumed dead, but her body has never been found, and her devastated family are unable to properly grieve. Every Christmas is a cruel reminder of their devastating loss. After enduring a bungled police investigation and a 2015 court case, in which two suspects were acquitted, Nicola's parents Marilyn and John now in their 70s and in poor health, have passed the baton to sons Scott, 54, and Nigel, 57, and to Nicola's cousin Amanda Eels, 40. Now, with a £100,000 reward and fresh impetus from an investigation team fronted by former police detective and TV presenter Mark Williams Thomas and forensic search expert Peter Falding, the family dare to hope that Nicola will finally be found. And that when she is, her remains will give up the secrets of one of the UK's longest unsolved murders. Amanda, a palliative care nurse, says. Nicola was the big sister I never had. I was eight years younger than Nikki, and I really looked up to her. When she disappeared, the enormity of what happened hit me a few days later when I saw my mum in the lounge looking out the window at the police helicopters overhead, sobbing. I'd never seen her cry before. She had everything to live for, adds Amanda. She completely adored her son and everyone who knew her loved her. Although only 10 at the time, Amanda remembers the entire city of Coventry was gripped by the disappearance, and memories of the young mum who vanished haven't faded in the 30 years since. Indeed, the search for Nicola was one of the biggest in UK police history, involving more than 80 officers, sniffer dogs and helicopters with heat-seeking cameras. The last person reported to have seen her alive was her boyfriend and father of her baby, Jason, who told police she waved at him as she set off around midday on December 14, 1991. In the days that followed her disappearance, several witnesses described seeing two men acting suspiciously in the area at the time, and a blue Ford Capri was seen nearby. One dog walker saw a man hiding in the bushes in the black pad, the local name given to the area of wasteland where she went missing. He also heard a car engine running nearby and a woman scream. Another witness claimed he saw two men arguing with a woman near a Ford Capri. And another claimed to have seen two men sitting in the car. Local man Nigel Barwell owned the blue Ford Capri and was arrested on December 17, along with his brother-in-law Thomas O'Reilly. Both men were 27 at the time. A search of Barwell's property uncovered a tent that had been dumped in undergrowth behind his garden. A manual for the same tent was found in the glove box of his car. The men were questioned, released on bail and asked to attend an identity parade. Barwell fled to France for a week, later claiming he feared he was being fitted up by police. More witnesses came forward. One woman claimed to have seen two men standing by a car near a path leading to the river so on the afternoon Nicola went missing. She said there appeared to be an object resembling a full black bin liner in the boot of the car. Witnesses didn't pick Barwell or O'Reilly out of an identity parade, and the men said that on the day Nicola disappeared, they had been stranded in a car park in Rugby Town Center, as Barwell's Ford Capri had broken down. Over the following months, more information came in and new searches were carried out at different locations, but nothing was found. The case against Barwell and O'Reilly was dropped. Months became years, with still no answers or justice for Nicola's desperate family. As time went on, new information saw police carry out numerous excavations and searches of gardens, land, a canal and a lake in the Coventry area between 1996 and 2014, however no trace of Nicola was ever found. Several arrests have been made over the years. In November 2007, Police arrested a 37-year-old man from Derbyshire on suspicion of the abduction and murder of Nicola, but no further action was taken against him. Two men, aged 74 and 45, were arrested as part of the investigation on June 20, 2012. The following day, 
The 74-year-old was released without charge. The 45-year-old was released on bail, then that August, charges against him were also dropped. In 2014, following a search of Coombe Pool Fishery, a lake at Coombe Country Park in Binley, near Coventry, Barwell and O'Reilly were arrested again. They were released on bail before being charged with Nicola's murder in January 2015. Amanda and her family hope this was the turning point in their quest for justice for Nicola and to finally bring her body home. During a six-week trial at Birmingham Crown Court that began in October 2015, the jury heard that the tent seized in 1991 had been tested with new DNA technology and that hairs found on it were 900 million times more likely to belong to Nicola Payne than anyone else. Number 2. The pair argued and Sarah left, telling her mum she'd see her tomorrow. That was the last time that Vicky Benford saw her little girl. Sarah Benford spent her early years in Havelock Street, in an unremarkable red brick terrace similar to the homes of thousands of children growing up in Kettering in the 1990s. She lived with her mum Vicky, her stepdad Gavin, her brother Josh and sister Anya. But it was at the age of just two when she first appeared on the radar of social services, that her life had already begun to go awry. Sarah started skipping school in reception and was already absconding from home age just eight. She started at Montague School aged 11 and was described as a confident bubbly girl. But by the time she turned 14 she'd been in three different children's homes, had started to use heroin, cocaine and speed, sniffed aerosols and had begun to self-harm. She was a regular runaway. Her mum Vicky had agreed with her going into care because she wanted her to get away from the petty thieves in Kettering who had sent her out to steal to feed their drug habits. Those investigating her disappearance, those charged with her care, and the media said Sarah had turned to prostitution and intimated she was a troubled teen who had chosen to run away, to mingle with the wrong crowds, and to take hard drugs. If Sarah had gone missing today, Enlightened by knowledge gleaned from years of high-profile child sexual exploitation and a paradigm shift in the way society views the grooming of children, baby-faced Sarah would be, been seen for what she was, a victim of sexual crimes by older men who wanted to exploit her, a victim of those who served their own interests by supplying drugs to her, and a victim of many of those charged with her care who repeatedly failed her. Long before she had gone missing the authorities would be asking, what had gone so terribly wrong in Sarah's life that had led her down this catastrophic path? What had so affected her that she had spent 41 of her 150 days in care missing? And where was she sleeping on the nights she spent away from her care home? There would be questions asked, investigations launched and arrests made. But back in 2000, so unconcerned were police officers about Sarah's multiple runaway attempts that on the day she disappeared, they refused to collect her from a house in Kettering despite pleas from her desperate mum. The publicity surrounding her disappearance was in stark contrast to the acres of coverage given over to bright Sussex teen Millie Dowler in 2002, who disappeared and was later tragically found murdered. Outside of Kettering, the name Sarah Benford is barely known. In 2008, Sarah's angry uncle Steve Cross from Corby told the independent newspaper, the police didn't treat it seriously enough at the beginning. Sarah was just another statistic to social services and the police, and to start with they didn't care. Then with pressure from the family through the media they thought, we'd better do something about this because it isn't going to go away. There is a culture of secrecy when kids from care homes go missing. Sarah had been in care for just a few short months before she went missing for the final, fatal time. She'd gone to live at her first care home in September 1999, after the death of her beloved Uncle Andy. Unable to cope with his death, she started hanging around with older people in Kettering and taking drugs. She spent time in Raven House Children's Home in Corby, then in an isolated secure unit then run by Northamptonshire County Council called St. John's in Tiffield, described later by another former resident as a placement for anyone for whom there was nowhere else to go. Sarah was moved to Welford House Children's Home in Northampton. While there, and aged just 13, she self-harmed, admitted meeting boys in a Bington Park for sex, and revealed to staff she was injecting herself with heroin. When she told staff about the boys she was having sex with, they merely reminded her to use contraception. 
a doctor who she saw at hospital after she had taken heroin said he could find nothing wrong. Later, her mum would say that Sarah was desperate to get out of the home, describing it as a holiday camp that let her come and go as she pleased. On March 31, 2000, Sarah left the unit and was reported missing. When she was found on April 2, staff notes said she had admitted having sex with men. It is not known if a police report was ever made about Sarah's claim. She was just a child and unable to give full consent to these men. Just a day later, on April 3, Sarah again walked out of the home and staff reported her missing. On April 6 she visited her mum where she worked in an amusement arcade in Kettering Town Centre. They argued. That was to be the final time Vicky saw her daughter later that day, Sarah phoned her mum from a house in Hampton Crescent, Kettering. She was high on drugs. A frantic Vicky phoned police and begged them to collect her and take her back to the care home. They refused, not for the first time. She had already been officially missing for three days. Documents later handed to this newspaper said police officers had told care home staff they could not and would not collect her and would not take her to Kettering Police Station to babysit her. That catastrophic decision has led to Northamptonshire Police's biggest ever missing persons inquiry lasting 20 years. There have been 5,000 lines of inquiry, 663 statements taken, 918 reports collated and 8 arrests but, crucially, no charges. There were some sightings in the days following her disappearance in Cherry Road and Highfield Road, but there the trail goes cold. Investigations at the time suggested she had traveled to Finchley, London, where more people were waiting to sexually exploit her. But no trace of her was ever found there. On May 12, her grandmother June Black of Ribblesdale Avenue in Corby phoned reporters at the Evening Telegraph. She was frustrated at the attempts to find Sarah so appealed herself for her granddaughter's safe return. A £500 reward was later offered. June became instrumental in keeping up the pressure on the authorities to find Sarah until her death in late 2003, just after the murder investigation was launched. The day Sarah went missing she was wearing the uniform of 1990s teens. A black puffer jacket, blue patchwork jeans and cream trainers. Her devastated mum pounded the streets and parks of Kettering looking for her for weeks. Four months after she was last seen, in August 2000, workers at Service 6 in Wellingborough said Sarah was brought in twice with a pimp and a known prostitute for a pregnancy test. Service 6 bosses reported that sighting to Paulus. Officers later said they believed there had been confirmed sightings of her until April 19 but that there was little evidence she is alive more than two or three months after her disappearance. Sarah's face appeared on milk cartons and on the sides of lorries, there were TV appeals and media campaigns. There were 200 sightings that had no positive outcome. There was hope that a girl seen at the supervision shop in Silver Street in May 2003 was Sarah, but that was later discounted by police. Three long and agonizing years went by for her heartbroken family. Derbyshire police were tasked with looking at the shortfalls in Northamptonshire police's investigation. Their report was never made public. In May 2003 Northamptonshire County Council, perhaps aware of their own shortcomings in Sarah's care, launched an independent inquiry into the police's handling of the case. Headed up by University of Northampton lecturer and solicitor Margaret Roberts, police refused to cooperate, saying it was not in the remit of NCC to investigate the police. The inquiry was later dropped. But this, perhaps, was a catalyst for the force to ramp up their investigation. Richard Jenkins had moved to South Wales from Kettering 18 months after Sarah's disappearance. His daughter Jessica had been friends with Sarah, and she had been to his house several times in the year before she went missing, staying over for a couple of nights. In June 2003, police began a painstaking search of his former family home in Highfield Road. They thought he had questions to answer. One of the places Sarah was last seen on the day she went missing was Highfield Road. Detectives then moved on to his new house in Mestig, South Wales where they dug up his garden to look for clues about Sarah's disappearance. Disgusted, in July 2003, Mr. Jenkins contacted Evening Telegraph reporters and told them that he had nothing to do with the case, that he didn't think Sarah was dead, and that he had no idea where she was. A reporter traveled to Wales to meet him. 
There, in his front room, he said, neither myself nor any of my daughters have seen Sarah since she went missing, and I just can't understand why they are looking at my house here or in Kettering. All this has really upset my youngest daughter especially as she thinks I've been accused of killing somebody, as does everyone who saw my garden being dug up. What am I supposed to have done, killed Sarah, buried her, then dug her up again two years later and moved her to South Wales? In July 2003 he was arrested by police and taken in for questioning. He later told our reporters that the investigation had ruined his life. He was eventually eliminated from the inquiry. Two more people from Kettering, a man aged 29 and a woman aged 37 were arrested on suspicion of supplying drugs to Sarah. Three houses including one in Windmill Avenue were searched. Officers visited Hackney to conduct property searches there. Finally, on September 23, 2003, police said they had no more hope that Sarah was alive and upgraded their inquiry to a murder investigation. It was the news Sarah's family had been dreading, but for them the news did not extinguish their hope that the youngster was still alive. DCI Charles Moffat said, there is little evidence of Sarah surviving beyond two or three months after she went missing. Searches resumed in earnest. Houses in Highfield Road and Nelson Street were searched and more arrests were made. A man aged 54 from Kettering and a 43-year-old man and a 38-year-old woman from London were arrested on suspicion of murder. They were later released and no charges were laid. Then a woman aged 41 from Kettering was arrested on suspicion of murder. She was also later released. A woman aged 46 from London was arrested on suspicion of perverting the course of justice. The independent inquiry was dropped to be replaced by a serious case review by the Area Child Protection Committee. By December the searches had moved to Weekly Woods near Kettering and Wakerley Woods on the border of Rutland and East Northamptonshire. Those searches turned up nothing of interest. Then, officers launched their highest profile search yet. They moved on to a piece of wasteland occupied by an elderly Polish man who was not implicated in the investigation at remote Finneton sightings near to the Furnace Lane Industrial Estate. Archaeologists were joined by cadaver dogs from Scotland and Greater Manchester working alongside forensic officers. The site was said to be significant in Sarah's life. Officers took away nine rundown caravans, six wrecked cars and bags and bags of junk were taken to a secret warehouse in Northampton to be combed for clues. A gun was found, but was not thought to be significant. Again, their painstaking search proved fruitless. On his retirement six years later, DCI Moffat would say the biggest regret of his career was not finding Sarah. A serious case review that concluded in July 2004 was damning. It found that NCC had been understaffed, that it missed several chances to identify Sarah as a child at risk and didn't follow proper processes to make sure that she didn't come to harm. The report said that professionals were operating against a back cloth of insufficient resources, overloaded systems, huge workloads and a lack of comprehensive procedures. It said the label of troubled adolescent masked and minimized the risks faced by the vulnerable child. They concluded that no in-depth assessment of her needs was carried out before she went missing, despite problems with non-attendance of school from the age of five, sexualized behavior from an early age and suicide attempts. Its eight recommendations were based around providing training for child protection. NCC overhauled the way in which it treated children in its care. It made sure there was someone available to pick up runaways 24 hours a day and trained its staff in looking out for the signs of abuse. More social workers were hired, and police and care workers vowed to strengthen their links to enable them to work together to look after troubled teens. Northamptonshire police have radically overhauled the way in which they deal with missing children. There are now immediate public appeals when youngsters go missing, and a specialist team has been set up to divert teens away from becoming involved with drug gangs. By August 2004 the trail into Sarah's whereabouts had gone cold and the huge investigation, named Operation Yacht, was scaled back. Then, in 2006, a concerned member of the public handed over a dossier to a newspaper reporter. It detailed the thoughts of care workers who looked after Sarah for the final months of her life in Welford House. 
It proved devastating for Vicky Benford, who tearfully told reporters that she should never have let her daughter go into care. One harrowing entry shows how Sarah had been told that her estranged biological dad wanted to speak to her, but when carers phoned him on her behalf he said he didn't want anything to do with her. In one section, there were details of how Sarah was found crying in another resident's room with her wrist slashed. The next day Sarah had been allowed to go for an unsupervised walk in Kingsthorpe. She returned armed with a pen knife at the time, Vicky said, it's awful, what were they thinking? The place was like a holiday camp, they were letting her come and go as she pleased. She was meant to be in care. Sarah didn't want to be there. They promised her that if she went a month without absconding they would transfer her to Rockingham Dean, where she wanted to be. She behaved herself, kept her side of the bargain, only to be told she would have to stay where she was. Ten years later, in 2016 on what would have been Sarah's 30th, birthday officers revisited Woodland at Wharton to try to find clues. DCI Martin Kinchin from the Force's cold case team said that the Force had never given up hope of discovering what happened to Sarah. A string of lead detectives over the years have said that are confident they know who killed Sarah, but they need help from the people of Kettering to find the evidence. DS Julie Gallagher has been working on the investigation for the past seven years and has today appealed for those with knowledge about Sarah's whereabouts to come forward to help Sarah's family finally find some peace. Number 3 In 2009 the hamlet of Lound, Lincolnshire, would be rocked by a shocking torture and murder. Ten years later, police have DNA and other evidence but no suspect. 50-year-old Alan Wood was well-liked and well-known in the small village he called home. He lived a quiet life, running a gardening business in the spring and summer, supplementing his income with night shifts at a nearby Sainbury's supermarket. He was last seen at his local pub, the Willoughby Arms, in nearby Little Bytham at around 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, October 31, 2009. By that coming Saturday, a colleague at Sainsbury's became worried by his continued absence and decided to pay him a visit at home. When he arrived at Allen's bungalow, he was surprised to see that both the front and back doors were wide open. Not wanting to intrude, but feeling that something was wrong, the concerned colleague phoned Allen's landlord. When he arrived, the two walked into the bungalow to be met with a horrific scene. Allen was face down on the living room floor in a large pool of blood, his hands bound behind his back with sellotape. The bungalow where Alan Wood was tortured and murdered was demolished in 2011. Google Maps still shows Lound as it was in 2009, the kind of sleepy place that doesn't warrant a regular Google update. But this pretty, picturesque area would not do Alan any favors, no one heard any screams, and no one saw anything suspicious. Police could only start piecing together what happened from clues at the scene. It is believed that Alan answered his door to someone some time on Thursday 1st November. As a gardener he was physically fit, so it is likely more than one person was involved in subduing him. Somehow they got in the house and tied Alan's hands behind his back. Examination of the sellotape used found small scraps of paper. This paper was later traced to a local bus company's tickets. Were the attackers local? Alan himself was reported to only travel by either car or motorcycle. Once incapacitated, the wounds to Alan's body and face suggest he was tortured. Police have speculated that this torture was to gain access to Alan's pin, as one of the attackers began withdrawing money from different ATM machines using Alan's card. This began on the Thursday night at 9.30 p.m., giving us a clear but wide window for when the attack started. Without knowing the motive, we can only speculate as to what led to the attack coming to an end. After being beaten and stabbed in the face, including one eye, Alan's throat was slit and he died a horrible death. Post-mortem examination shows that a decapitation was attempted but abandoned. The bus ticket evidence was useful, but not the only piece found. A footprint was found that police traced to one of two Converse styles available at the time, most importantly, blood that wasn't Allen's was found at the scene. Could he have injured one of the attackers during the initial subjugation? Or did they slip with the knife during the torture? Whatever the reason, a full DNA profile of a man has been created. It was run through national and international databases with no matching results. Finally, 
We come to the ATM machines. The fact someone tried using one on the Thursday evening gives us one clue. They hid their faces, in a way, that indicated knowledge of the local CCTV. ATM branches were used in such a way that suggested knowledge of the town layout. And the multiple use suggests that at least two people were involved, one staying behind to guard Alan. Police released the CCTV of one suspect, a scarf or bandana covering his lower face. Effet suspect Alan would murder Effet suspect Alan would murder a witness saw the man using the Sainsbury ATM that matched the suspect's description, prompting the creation of this EFIT. Simple robbery could not be the motive here, otherwise they would have cleared out the bungalow of all valuables. They wanted cash, and cash alone, why would that be? Police have ruled out any drug or gambling debts, saying that background checks found nothing that suggested Alan was involved in anything untoward. He was on good terms with his ex-wife and, besides, had hardly built up enough valuable assets to make murder attractive to any potential beneficiaries. There have been no more crimes like this that I can find across the UK, let alone the local area. We cannot get past the fact that Alan was targeted personally and for cash. He was killed in the most horrific way, a way usually reserved for revenge or as a warning to others. There is a rumor that he resembled a manager at the supermarket and, perhaps, he was the victim of mistaken identity. If the police found anything to suggest this was the case then they have said nothing, no doubt to protect the other man. If he was found to have the kind of debts Alan was killed for, then his life may still be in danger. Finally, there is the Eastern European connection. Detectives announced in 2014 that they want to speak to Polish national Paul Rich who worked at a local car wash frequented by Alan. Rather strangely, they say that he is not a suspect, but he has evaded them thus far. They have also gone through the unusual steps of having the Lincolnshire Police website page on this crime translated into Polish, Albanian, and Lithuanian. There must be a clue either at the scene or in Alan's past that is directing police down this path. The Lincolnshire police released a press pack as part of their ongoing investigation into the murder of Alan Wood. I have made it available here as they have removed other web pages relating to this case in the past. When I first heard about the murder of Alan Wood I immediately made the link in my mind to the strange case of al Qaeda in Colorado. Although DNA has been found at both scenes, it is suspected there were two perpetrators in Lound which reduces the likelihood of a match, even if the same person is involved. In 2004 Alkite was murdered in a similar way to Alan. He was hogtied and tortured for hours, stabbed around the eye and nearly decapitated. His ATM card was used to withdraw money. Just as with Alan, no justification for such a brutal death could be found in Al's life. There are more clues in this case, but they have all been a dead end so far and point to a highly organized and cunning killer. The DNA, along with witnesses who encountered the suspect before the murder suggest an Eastern European ethnicity. Given the timescale of these two crimes, I suspect that the perpetrators was ex-military and served during the 1990s Yugoslavian war. There have been plenty of stories since of former soldiers who turned to killing after witnessing or taking part in horrific war crimes during that terrible conflict. If the same person is not involved in these two crimes, I suspect both killers share a similar past. Number 4. The disappearance of a Liverpool man who was involved in the city's criminal underworld is still being investigated by police. Lyndon Nowell said goodbye to his partner for the last time on January 24, 2002. The 28-year-old was seen alive at the Coronation Pub on Childwall Valley Road between 8 p.m. and 8.45 p.m. He then drove off from the pub car park in a silver Ford Focus. Mr. Nowell is believed to have traveled to Manchester on the night he disappeared to see someone. His car was found burned out in the early hours of the following day on Blantyre Road in the Swinton area of Salford. He was known to police and had once associated with major crime groups and some of Merseyside's more notorious underworld figures. The Echo took a look back at the facts of his disappearance. In the 1990s Mr. Nowell traveled to South America with runcorn man Peter Pepsi Smith. The two men had been sent to Colombia to make contact with members of a drug cartel. It later emerged that Smith was a trusted lieutenant of Jason and Ian Fitzgibbon 
and that undercover police officers had followed Smith and Mr. Nowell on the trip to Columbia. Smith was later charged with drug offenses as part of Operation Black, a major police investigation which targeted the two Fitzgibbon brothers. Jason and Ian Fitzgibbon later admitted their part in the plot and were jailed for eight and seven years each respectively. At his trial, Smith, who denied three counts of conspiracy to supply heroin, was described as the crime group's transport manager. Smith was found guilty of conspiracy to supply drugs and jailed for 11 years. Although police believed Mr. Nowell had traveled to South America with Smith, Mr. Nowell was not charged with any drug offenses. There is no suggestion that Smith or the Fitzgibbons had anything to do with Mr. Nowell's subsequent disappearance. Wayne Basnett South Liverpool man Wayne Basnett was shot dead in Hale Village on December 22, 2010. A 25-year-old man was later charged with Mr. Basnett's murder. The murder trial at Chester Crown Court heard that Mr. Basnett and his then-girlfriend had been arrested as part of a murder investigation following the disappearance of Mr. Nowell in 2002. The girlfriend told the court how Mr. Basnett had known Mr. Nowell. She said she was arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to murder after the disappearance, but she thought Mr. Basnett had gone to the police station of his own accord and could not remember what he was arrested on suspicion of. Mr. Basnett and his partner were not charged in relation to the disappearance of Mr. Nowell. The girlfriend said a bag and shoebox containing heroin were recovered from her Gateacre flat in the investigation, but she did not know where they had come from or who they belonged to. She was asked by Steve.